Hello and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining in today. It is my extreme pleasure and welcome you all to this three-day uh, virtual ShipMD workshop. My name is Convergent Singh from Critical Path Institute in Tucson, Arizona, the organization running this event. Uh, to start off the things, we have the president and CEO of Critical Path Institute, Joseph Sheeran, with us, who is going to provide opening welcome remarks to you all. Uh, thanks again for joining, and Joseph, you have next. Thank you, Kamaljit. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Systems of Hospitals for Innovation in Pediatrics Medical Devices, SHIP-MD, the National Innovation Ecosystem for Pediatric Medical Devices Development Workshop. About one and a half year ago, the Critical Path Institute, abbreviated CPAT, was asked if we, could, if we would be interested in supporting the setup of a new process to help make devices available for pediatric patients. Out of a deep care for pediatric patients, we enthusiastically took on the opportunity to provide CPAD collaborative skills and regulatory expertise for this initiative. Currently, there are only a few devices approved for pediatric patients. Development in this field is slow and industry does not see the return on investment to make this a priority in their companies. The non-availability of these highly needed pediatric devices leads to suboptimal care for some of our most vulnerable patients, with longer hospital stays, worst outcomes, and higher insurance costs being a reality that many are familiar with. We not only want to change this, we need to change this. Through this collaborative effort, we aim to reduce hospital stays improve health outcomes, reduce costs, and more importantly, make patients healthier and parents happier with this better level of care. For those who are not familiar with CPAT, we are a nonprofit organization based out of Tucson, Arizona. We operate in a neutral, pre-competitive arena and foster the availability of novel treatments through the collaboration of stakeholders all across the medical de development product development ecosystem, like regulatory agencies, industry, academia, patient organizations. For those who are familiar with CPAT, you already know that we are involved in several other pediatric and neonatal initiatives, such as the International Neonatal Consortium, the Real World Neonatal Data Project, and our continued work resulting from our partnership with the Institute for Advanced Clinical Trials for, for Children, IACT, which in fact is a spin-off from CPAT. When taking on SHIP-MD, we had a steep learning curve to get to know the full device ecosystem and the subtle differences in interest and focus of all the important stakeholders. We managed to forge a team with all these stakeholders where diversity of opinion outlook is sincerely valued. Diversity of opinion leads to better outcomes. Hence, we had good and in-depth discussions. We are proud to have brought together stakeholders representing many different interests to focus on the interest of our most vulnerable patients and bring SHIP-MD to fruition. AdvaMed, FDA, the American Academy of Pediatrics, all stakeholders are clearly aligned to improve healthcare for pediatric patients. Our shared vision is to speed up and facilitate the development of novel pediatric uh, devices. This covers the whole value chain for the pediatric device development, from inception to design to testing, approval and launch of the product, and to making sure that the product is accessible through appropriate reimbursement. Despite these, uh, despite these complex processes, SHIP-MD's mission is simple to improve public health for children and transforming the pediatric medical device ecosystem by de-risking and accelerating developmental processes to stimulate investment and innovation in pediatric devices. This mission would not be possible without Dr. Vassum Perez from CDRH at the FDA, who provided the team with his vision of the new process that we would now call SHIP-MD. We created five work groups to discuss the different stages of device development and discussed in more detail the elements needed to make this system work. 
Each work group will report their progress in this workshop. And we hope that many of you will provide us actionable feedback as to if we are on the right track and what we can further improve. We anticipate that this workshop, is, its proceedings, and your important feedback will result in a strategic plan on how best to proceed with the next steps. I would like to thank my fellow Executive Committee members for their invaluable input making this workshop possible, Bassum Paris, Tara Federici, John Davis, and Geoffrey Rosenthal, and our colleagues at CPAD, the project lead Kanwaljit Singh, Laura Butt, Klaus Romero, Sarah Speed, and Karen Stem. In addition, we owe our sincere thanks to all the work group members and leads and the presenters who have put in many hours to make this workshop possible. I'm looking forward to the presentations, discussions, and feedback that will move the ship MD forward into implementation. Thank you for making the time available to attend this three-day workshop. I hope you enjoy and importantly participate in these discussions. Thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, now, as we uh, go forward through the day uh, and uh, with our various uh, other plenary sessions and uh, the work team sessions over the next few days, I think it's going to be helpful if we describe uh, in a few words what exactly SHIP MD is. Uh, uh, to put it very simply, uh, we envision SHIP MD as a, a national innovation ecosystem designed to accelerate innovation in pediatric medical devices. And uh, to improve public health for children, SHIP-MD is aimed at transforming the pediatric medical device ecosystem by de-risking and accelerating device uh, development process uh, to stimulate investment and innovation in pediatric medical devices. The next slide, please. Uh, this slide here depicts various stages of ship md currently we are in phase one uh, the conceptual pre-consortium phase uh, in this phase a team of volunteers uh, those are the people from the ship md coordinating committee uh, they have further subdivided themselves into five work teams based on their interest and areas of expertise and they have been working with the past one year to develop and articulate uh, the anticipated value proposition of the ship md framework these uh, work teams will be the ones who will present their framework and their work over the next two, two days in this workshop. Uh, in the next phase, uh, the, that is the consortium phase, we will incorporate short, medium, and long-term goals to implement the framework that has been developed uh, by the work teams uh, to finally launch the ship MD. So, uh, and that phase where the ship MD is launched is the phase uh, three. Uh, where that framework is going to be implemented, resulting in the formal launch of a, a standalone ship and the entity. The next slide, please. And now, as we go through and discuss, discuss the various challenges presented in pediatric medical device development over the next three days, uh, let's not forget why we are undertaking this entire effort in the first place, uh, that is the children. Uh, to bring help bring some perspective into this entire conversation, uh, we have Olivia Omar to share some words of uh, her experience. Olivia, uh, by the way of introduction, is a 17-year-old teenager with type 1 diabetes who is going to relate her experience and challenges with medical devices. And then, you know, that'll give you an idea on how, how an entirely new ecosystem such as Ship MD will uh, eventually help children like Olivia. Uh, now, without further ado, I present to you a pre-recorded message by Olivia. Thank you for having me today. My name is Olivia Omer and I'm 17 years old and I'm a senior in high school. I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at age 3 and since I've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroid disease and an ultra-rare urticaria that is triggered by the sun. I'm also a straight-A student, a state finalist in golf, and an all-state academic awardee. I also plan on attending college in the fall, and I've been accepted to every school that I've applied to. I also plan on continuing my golf career at the collegiate level. I think it's always important to know this stuff because kids like me are often the ones to strive beyond the medical diagnosis and become the best version of ourselves. And what helps is the ability to have the best medical technology and innovation available. With the world's best medicine, kids like me can achieve anything we set our minds to. When I was diagnosed at age three, type one diabetes was a new concept for our family. 
While at the hospital, my parents researched better ways to get care for me. At the top of every list was a device known as an insulin pump. In 2006, this was still new technology, and while adult patients were given access to the technology, very few pediatric patients were, and especially not at age three. My parents asked and were told they had to wait a minimum of one year before receiving a script for a pump. That did not sit well with my mom, and so she researched studies to show how care was better with technology. Just a few months after my diagnosis, our endocrinology team agreed and wrote a letter to help me receive my first pump. The letter had to be override insurance requirements of collecting blood sugars to prove that I was unstable and that I needed it, which this continues to be a problem. Even in 2020, patients like me are told that their care must be horrible before they can get approval to receive new technology. I wore my first pump for two months and then my parents discovered that there was a newer version out which had a remote that was involved. This was another issue. When technology advances, patients are often forced to wait. Insurance rules are sometimes four to five years before a patient can get a new medical device. If you think about this rule, it makes no sense. Cell phones advance every year, and at the most, people wait just two years before the contract is up. How can medical devices be held back for so long? Currently, I also wear a continuous glucose monitor that relays blood sugar information to both my insulin pump and my cell phone. A few years ago, I underwent an endoscopy and my anesthesiologist was so impressed with my medical devices that he asked for instructions on how to use them before my procedure. In recovery, he came back to my bedside and explained that it was so helpful and he was so excited to see my blood sugars in real time that he wished more parents had access to CGMs and pump care. Sadly, many kids like me have to wait for years to be able to get access and there are still many physicians that are not aware of the technology that is available to patients. Sometimes I find myself being the expert in helping to share what I'm using. Having a CGM is critically important to me as it allows me to have independence. I am able to manage my blood sugars through long golf tournaments or when I distance run. Next year, I'm off to college and the CGM will support me around the clock, especially when I'm sick or sleeping, two times that are very vulnerable for patients like me. As newer technology advances, the need for kids like me will continue to grow. There are currently products being created that are implanted under the subcutaneous tissue that relay blood sugars meaning that there is less need for pokes or skin irritation. There is also better products being developed that help release insulin, much like a real pancreas would do. I hope kids won't have to wait to receive the technology that will make a difference in their care or outlook on their medical condition. Next year, I will be studying engineering to help bring my ideas to a wider audience in hopes of improving care for all, because I know that we need more innovation to make childhood a little easier. Being a kid is the most important job for childhood. Thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Olivia, for such a thoughtful, emotional, yet uh, uplifting narrative. Uh, before we go any further to the actual plenary speeches, I'm going to invite Vasum on the stage and provide us with his brief introductory remarks. And then following that, we will be well on our way to the plenary talk. Uh, thank you, Joseph, and a special thanks to Olivia. I think she um, really just clarified why we're here and the work that we have ahead of us. Um, I want to send out a welcome to everyone that has joined today. Really looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts. Today truly is a wonderful day for pediatrics and for children. We honor their innate value by coming together to ensure that children have a robust innovation ecosystem that works for their unique medical device needs that helps ensure they benefit equitably from advancements in technology that can improve their healthcare. It feels like such a short time ago uh, when I just began drafting the original SHIP framework. And we're already at this point. Um, it's a first step, it's an initial step, but it's an important step. And it's a step that we're taking most importantly together. I've been inspired by the shared insights, support and dedication of so many of you. And I want to send out a sincere thank you uh, to all the assistance support uh, that I've received. I want to especially thank the executive committee and the coordinating committee, composed of experts from across the ecosystem, as uh, Kanwaljeet and Joseph mentioned. 
They have dedicated so much of their time, uh, shared their expertise during this past year to help refine the framework, develop the value proposition for all stakeholders, and deliberate many aspects to ensure that we can move together in an aligned path forward. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the CPATH team, the Subversive team, and the Lotus Nile team for having done so much to ensure that we reach today ready, uh, that we're ready to smoothly and dynamically engage with all of you virtually during this workshop. As I mentioned, we really look forward to your input and feedback. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Jeff Shuren, the Director of the FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health. My job here is pretty easy since uh, Jeff requires no introduction in this arena, uh, but I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the environment Jeff's leadership has fostered at CDRH. It's an environment that supports innovative thinking, that ensures stability while taking steps towards growth. It's an environment that supports collaborative efforts to improve how we do business so we can better serve the American public. And it's an environment that supports ambitious and strategic initiatives like ShipMD that take a systematic approach to address longstanding public health issues uh, to better serve all populations. So on behalf of children and special populations, allow me to say thank you, Jeff, for supporting this initiative and its future and for helping to make the future of pediatric health care a little bit brighter. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeff Shuren. Well, thank you, Basum, and allow me to add my welcome to everyone. It's my pleasure to join all today for this important conversation regarding the SHIP-MD framework and how we can work collaboratively to better serve the medical device needs of children. I know the SHIP-MD Executive Committee and Coordinating Committee have been working diligently throughout this past year to refine the framework and develop the presentations that will help guide our conversations over the next three days. I'd be remiss not to at least briefly contextualize this exceptional work against the backdrop of what we have all endured for about a year now. There are a number of sentiments I could use to describe this period. And for this meeting, I'll choose resilience. Resilience is fitting here since it's the nature children demonstrate to us every day. Generally, children learn, adapt, and do what they do better every day they naturally innovate. At CDRH, we've become very familiar with this approach. And since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, CDRH has been all hands on deck, working creatively and collaboratively across our offices to facilitate the development and availability of medical devices as expeditiously and safely as possible. And CDRH was the first FDA center to utilize the agency's authority to issue emergency use authorizations, or EUAs. And so far, we've received over 5,700 pre-EUA requests and EUA submissions, and we've authorized more than 600 medical devices for COVID. And this is more than 10 times the number of EUAs issued for all previous public health emergencies combined. The pandemic has highlighted that the Food and Drug Administration is far more than foods and drugs. Ensuring the availability of accurate diagnostic tests, personal protective equipment, ventilators, and other critical devices and supplies for healthcare workers and patients has been an important part of the pandemic response efforts. Now, while prioritizing the overwhelming demands of the public health emergency, we've continued our day-to-day -day work receiving almost 8,000 submissions for non-COVID devices in 2020. And to continue to carry out the FDA's mission of safeguarding public health, so many of our staff have been working long hours, weekends, and evenings. I remain very proud and amazed at their dedication. And we've adapted as an organization as well. While rapidly increasing our telework capacity to 100%, We've shuffled staff expertise amongst our review teams to better meet the needs for the pandemic. And we've reprioritized our programs in order to maintain operational efficiency during this unique time. But we haven't changed course on priorities that support our fundamental shared values and service to the American public. We're continuing progress on advancing regulatory science and novel methods of providing patients 
an increasingly greater voice in the work we do, providing industry with transparent and efficient regulatory pathways and optimizing safety through innovation. The declaration of a public health emergency triggered our EUA authorities, allowing us to provide extensive regulatory flexibility to expedite the development, validation, authorization, and deployment of critical medical devices for COVID, flexibilities we do not have outside of such emergencies. And this experience with the pandemic has made it even more clear that the regulatory paradigm established over 40 years ago in federal statute for medical devices is not well suited for many present day technologies. It may not be sustainable without a new and efficient approach to medical device oversight and ways of doing business. The lessons learned about the importance of regulatory flexibility to public health and patient care could inform a more modern day framework for the oversight of medical devices that is better tailored to the technologies of today and tomorrow. In a time of extraordinary medical and scientific innovation, innovation that empowers patients and care partners, we stand at the intersection of science, medicine, and policy. And we're beginning to see more clearly that technology is no longer the limiting factor when it comes to continuing to achieve the promise of improved medical care options and outcomes for all populations. Only about two to three generations ago, big pacemaker machines that help maintain a regular heartbeat had to sit outside the body with wires connected through the chest to the heart. Today, pacemakers about the size of a nickel have been developed to be deployed through a blood vessel and fix heart rhythm problems. But these are designed, evaluated, approved, and labeled only for adults. With continuing exponential achievements in technology, we have to ask ourselves, are the traditional limitations, such as size, growth, and metabolism, truly valid barriers anymore to device development for children? In the field of pediatrics encompasses some of the most complex clinical issues and procedures in the world of medicine and surgery. And many of you provide this care every day. Advancements in technology will continue to allow even safer ways to care for patients and to gather clinical evidence. And hospitals across the country that administer this level of care every day for children have the breadth and depth of infrastructure, experience, and expert personnel to safely generate evidence about novel devices. The technology is available, the clinical evidence generation infrastructure is available, and the dedicated pediatric experts are available. But multiple factors, including market forces and reimbursement paradigms and aspects of the regulatory process are considered to be barriers that limit pediatric device development. During the past decade, despite legislation from Congress and regulatory process improvements and new policies and programs implemented by CDRH, the vast majority of novel device approvals have been for adult populations. Roughly 10% of medical devices approved by CDRH through the PMA and HDE pathways, the two pathways for high benefit and high risk medical devices have been approved for children less than 18 years of age. And around 4% have been approved for newborns and toddlers, those children most likely to suffer dire consequences of congenital conditions. In addition, Internal review of pediatric experts at CDRH have highlighted that the vast majority of the devices labeled for adults in recent years have the potential to treat, diagnose, or cure a condition that occurs in a pediatric population. And despite multiple thoughtful legislative changes intended to spur innovation through the HD program, which is designed for small populations such as pediatrics, we have yet to see any significant change in the number of HDE specially labeled devices for children. If these programs and regulatory pathways are not sufficiently meeting the medical device needs for pediatric patients, we should consider novel and perhaps pediatric specific regulatory options. For instance, 
a progressive approval pathway that included or focused on pediatrics, potentially bolstered by the added safety infrastructure of the SHIP MD framework, could be tailored to meet the needs of pediatric patients and innovators. Under such a pathway, which would require legislation to implement, eligible devices would meet the HDE or similar standard to get to market, but without the current restrictions, such as a bright line cutoff on the size of the affected population, but would have to meet the full US regulatory standard, a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness to remain on the market after a pre-specified time period. Now this approach could incentivize and facilitate pediatric device of development and access while generating more robust clinical evidence to support reimbursement and guide clinical use. However, regulatory advancements alone may not be sufficient to address the longstanding dearth of medical devices defined, evaluated, and labeled for pediatric patients. In generations of pediatricians and other clinicians caring for children have grown accustomed to the necessity of regularly using devices to bind, evaluate, and approve for adults in children, essentially for an indication for which the device was not labeled. Such use termed off-label or physician-directed is such a fundamental aspect of pediatric care that is often supported by expert opinion, published data, and professional guidelines. In fact, many pediatric medical and surgical trainees are appropriately taught to alter devices approved for adults in order to meet the unique needs of their pediatric patients. Although necessary and conducted as safely as possible by pediatric clinicians, this common practice exposes pediatric patients to a benefit risk profile that may be different than that experienced by the patient for which the device was evaluated and approved. In addition, lack of labeling for pediatrics also limits industry-supported educational and training opportunities around pediatric use. The generational duration of this public health issue is an indication of its complexity and potential need for systemic reform. I want to take a moment to commend Basum for his leadership in creating and developing a strategic vision and his efforts to collaboratively engage, align, and leverage strengths within our healthcare system to begin developing a more integrated and robust pediatric medical device ecosystem. And during our 2018 public meeting on pediatric medical device development, many of the challenges to improving availability of medical devices designed and labeled for children were discussed and verified. And we focused on integrating three fundamental areas, optimizing evidence generation, creating regulatory value and simplicity, and developing a supportive marketplace. Our commitment to developing real solutions that address the real needs in this area, I trust was clear. Our willingness to engage on topics such as the marketplace that you don't typically hear about during FDA public meetings. Over 75% of participants told us that some aspect of return on investment influenced by multiple factors along the total product life cycle was a key reason for being unwilling or unable to enter the pediatric medical device market. The SHIP MD framework is designed to address these shared and sometimes variable challenges by leveraging and integrating the collective opportunities within this diverse national stakeholder community with the primary shared goal of increasing and accelerating safe medical device development for children. Despite this tumultuous year, I'm truly impressed with the diligent progress that the SHIP MD Executive Committee and Coordinating Committee have made in refining the original framework and clarifying the value of this proposal for all stakeholders, especially the children that require medical devices and their families. One clear outcry of this past year has been the even more resounding call for greater equity in so many forms including healthcare. Equitable availability of medical devices that have been designed, evaluated, and labeled for the use of children is fundamental to the FDA's public health mission. Innovation should be our answer to the call. 
Innovation that provides the right tools and level of flexibility, that provides appropriate patient safeguards, that keeps us in the front of emerging science, that helps us better protect and promote public health, and helps us achieve our vision that patients in the US, which includes children, have access to high quality, safe and effective medical devices of public health importance first in the world. Now we look to all of you for your feedback and insights as we continue to work with all interested stakeholders to foster a robust ecosystem that meets the medical device needs of pediatric and special populations. I look forward to hearing from the executive committee and coordinating committee and all of you regarding what the FDA can do on our part, even better and in partnership for the benefit of children. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shuren. Uh, next up, uh, we will hear a few words from Scott Whitaker, who is the president and CEO of Advermet, one of the largest uh, medical technology trade associations. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today and for being here yourself. Just being here and listening and engaging, you're making a huge difference in the life of so many people, especially children. Before I begin, I want to thank CPATH, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and all of the leaders from the pediatric healthcare system. I also want to take a, take a minute to thank FDA and CDRH, their leadership, and the entire employee base there for being here as our partners and for constantly committing to improvement. I've been able to witness firsthand the impact your actions have had on patients. My daughter, like Olivia, who spoke earlier, has type 1 diabetes, and I'll talk about her experience a little bit later. But for now, I want to say that the innovation that has happened in the diabetes sector since her diagnosis is, diagnosis is nothing short of amazing. I also want to especially thank Dr. Shuren, because I know, Dr. Shuren, how hard you have worked to make innovative diabetes technology available to patients, including children. So it's great to be here alongside uh, of you, Jeff, as well as Dr. Savio Beers and Dr. Kurt Newman and the others who will be addressing you today as well. You don't have to be a parent to agree that children ought to have access to the best possible health care. Our healthcare innovators, including our medical technology manufacturers, work hard every day to deliver solutions for children who are suffering. But unfortunately, every day they run into obstacles. There are obstacles in financing. The market size is small and the risk is oftentimes very big. The return on investment can never be guaranteed. There are obstacles in development and testing. For example, a child's growth may pose challenges for a device performance over time or require a longer monitoring period. There are also obstacles in the regulatory approval process and reimbursement. There are unique ethical considerations when it comes to considering and conducting clinical trials with children. And it can be very difficult to recruit the right participants into those trials. Of course, I'm only skimming the surface here, but the real problem isn't the obstacles themselves, it's the consequences that come with them. The number of pediatric medical devices in the R&D pipeline is incredibly low right now, especially when we consider the rapid pace of medical device development in every other area. In other words, under the current environment, amazing medical device innovation is happening, but in some cases, it's leaving children behind. Take orthopedic or spine health, for instance. There are dozens of approved orthopedic device, uh, devices that adults can choose from. They're sure to find a, dev a device that works for them based on their anatomy and their condition. But children have far fewer options to choose from, if they have any options to choose from at all. A lot of time, an orthopedic surgeon may be able to try or modify an adult device to try to fit a child patient. And that's certainly nowhere near ideal. Children are not just simply small adults. Their bones have greater elasticity. Their bodies are still changing. They need treatments that are really designed for them. I see that dynamic play out with my own daughter who lives with type one diabetes. Olivia's story really touched my heart because it reflects a lot of my personal and my daughter's experience as well. Like Olivia, my daughter has strived to be beyond her diagnosis. She's a great student, a good athlete, and very involved in her community. 
but it's taken a lot for her to get where she is today. When she was first diagnosed, it was incredibly difficult just to get her equipped with a simple insulin pump. Then it was difficult to make sure she had the newest and best model. And then again, it became difficult as we were working to get her onto a CGM. But I'd be remiss if I didn't say how grateful we are for all those technologies and all the innovators and the work that FDA did as well to make sure eventually she got access to those. Medical technology innovation has enhanced and improved her life beyond what any of us thought was possible when she was first diagnosed about 10 years ago. But the access part is only one part of the equation, but it shouldn't be as fraught as it is with challenges. Children really deserve better than this. And I know that collectively we can all do better. That's why for the past year and a half, AdvoMed is working under the leadership of the Critical Path Institute with the American Academy of Pediatrics, FDA and other stakeholders on a new strategic framework to improve the pediatric medical device ecosystem. It's called SHIP-MD, System of Hospitals for Innovation in Pediatrics Medical Devices. It connects specific hospitals in a hub and spoke model, hospitals with expertise and experience it takes to get a pediatric device through a clinical trial and through the various regulatory processes. It connects those hospitals with the innovators that have near ready devices or trial ready devices, even devices that have already received some type of regulatory clearance or approval. Then the hospitals and the innovators can work together to get the device across the finish line. I wanna revisit the obstacles I mentioned earlier, but this time I wanna tell you how SHIP MD is gonna make them much smaller. And in some cases we hope make them completely disappear. The first one, investment. How can a pediatric device innovator secure proper investment? A contract with SHIP-MD should inspire real confidence in investors and help eliminate some of the risk. Investors can be sure that through SHIP-MD, the innovator they're backing is getting the right advice on trial design, business plan, market research strategy, the regulatory process, basically everything that it takes to be successful. Once SHIP-MD's reputation is solidified, I can see investors actually using that model as a way to find worthy investment opportunities. And again, eventually I can see the potential for SHIP-MD to create a, a separate nonprofit arm that would act as an investment fund essentially for pediatric device innovators. So that's hurdle one. Hurdle two, development and testing. SHIP-MD participants would get access to comprehensive clinical trial logistics, including more difficult aspects like site selection and patient recruitment. Sites included in the SHIP-MD network would all have the proper expertise and resources and staff. Plus, they'd operate under SHIP-MD's standardized contracting agreements and the IRB protocols as well. It means less cost and less time for our innovators in this program. And for those participants whose devices are already approved, they can access real-world evidence resources for post-market surveillance and expanded indication purposes as well. In short, SHIP-MD innovators don't have to learn their development and testing lessons the hard way. They can learn from the innovators who have gone before them. They can use templates that are proven to work. And finally, and most, maybe most significantly, hurdle three, the regulatory approval and reimbursement pro pro process. A device is no good to anyone if patients can't access it. On the regulatory side, as it stands, the FDA re review process for pediatric devices is complex and sometimes slow. So SHIP-MD aims to fix the problem by partnering with FDA in a new pediatric breakthrough device program. It would work like the existing FDA breakthrough device program, but it's tailored specifically for pediatrics. In short, once a SHIP MD device is designated as breakthrough, the device innovator and FDA will enter into a more interactive and expedited pre submission and review process. And SHIP MD will match the device innovator with the device champion, a member of the program of the hospital which specializes in the product or disease area. The device champion can work with the device innovator and the FDA to help shepherd it through the regulatory process. 
So FDA will be able to access ShipMD clinical experience and expertise to help them with their benefit risk analysis on the device in question. FDA's standard breakthrough program has, has achieved so much success, and I want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Sheeran and the FDA for that. But why not expand that and take that set of success to pediatrics as well? And ShipMD will maintain a resource portal that has information on real-world evidence considerations, data extrapolation, pre- and post-market evidence balance, and other FDA regulatory programs. So now for the reimbursement side. Again, right now, reimbursement can be very slow and complex. Medicaid is a primary payer for many children, and there are 51 different state Medicaid programs, if you think about that. Not to mention, Medicaid doesn't provide adequate reimbursement oftentimes to its incentivized new applicants. So our solution here again is a breakthrough-like program where Medicaid would mirror the current Medicare breakthrough program. This would harmonize FDA decisions and reimbursement decisions so that an FDA breakthrough designation provides specific, reliable coverage and payment. For non-breakthrough ship MD devices, innovators will receive invaluable educational resources for helping navigate through these reimbursement challenges. And in the meantime, ShipMD will engage with Medicaid programs that serve ShipMD hospitals to optimize reimbursement through the evidence generation process. I know I've laid out a lot of action items here today, but they're important. And still, they're just the first of many more to come because we have a lot to do before we can tap into the unbridled potential of pediatric device innovation. But between all of us here today at this conference, I know and I'm certain we can get it done. My kids inspire me to complete this mission every day. Now it's our turn together to turn that inspiration into action and into progress. Thanks so much for having me. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, next up, we have uh, Dr. Lee Savio Beers, who is the president of American Academy of Pediatrics. Good morning. My name is Dr. Lee Beers, president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. I am also a professor of pediatrics and the medical director for community health and advocacy at Children's National Hospital. On behalf of the 67,000 primary care pediatrician, pediatric medical subspecialist, and pediatric surgical specialist members of the AAP, many of whom are here today, it is a pleasure to be with you to explore this critically important topic of advancing pediatric medical and surgical device development. The Academy is so pleased to be a part of this multi-sector effort to refine the strategic framework called the System of Hospitals for Innovation in Pediatrics Medical Devices, or SHIP-MD. We thank the Critical Path Institute for hosting this meeting, and I thank my fellow speakers for today's plenary session. Though we are unable to be together in person, I hope that day will come soon. And in particular, we wanna thank and acknowledge Dr. Jeff Rosenthal, a pediatric cardiologist at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, for representing the AAP on the executive committee for the SHIP-MD initiative. Dating back to the passage of the Pediatric Medical Device Safety and Improvement Act of 2007 and its subsequent reauthorizations, the AAP has been at the forefront of advocacy for children who need medical devices. Because unfortunately, pediatricians are too often left without safe, effective, and innovative medical devices for our patients. We've learned over time that sometimes it takes changes in laws and regulations to ensure children have the best and safest products available to them. In addition, we know we need pediatric experts to be involved in decision-making and consultation at every step of the therapeutic development process. I was struck by Olivia's compelling story of being a teenager, navigating type one diabetes with her parents since age three, and finding it easier to obtain the new iPhone model than the latest insulin pump to better manage her disease. Olivia embodies why we are all here today, to strive to improve devices for children Historically, medical devices for children often lag five to 10 years behind those for adults. And for a child, that's a lifetime. As you frequently heard us say, children are not little adults. They need medical and surgical devices that account for their growth and development and allow them to maintain activities of daily life, like playing in the park and going to school. 
Despite widespread therapeutic needs, most medical and surgical devices used in children don't have approval or clearance from the Food and Drug Administration for use in pediatric populations. In fact, in recent years, less than 5% of pre-market application medical devices, the highest risk class of devices have been labeled for use in children under the age of 16. As a result, pediatricians often find themselves without the medical or surgical device they need to care for their patients. Off-label use of medical devices in children is necessary and appropriate for many childhood medical and surgical conditions, but the ideal will always be devices developed for and tested in children. Much more needs to be done to address the regulatory, legal, financial, and other hurdles that have contributed to the reliance on off-label uses of medical devices. The ongoing devastating SARS-CoV-2 pandemic is a stark reminder of what is at stake for children. From diagnostics to vaccines to therapeutics, as technology advances, children are being left behind. We must also look critically at the disproportionate burden of disease on Black and Latina children and ensure that policy interventions address these disparities and not deepen them. For example, an equity-based strategy must be created and implemented to ensure that device and drug clinical trial participants are sufficiently diverse especially when the product being studied is intended to be used in a condition that disproportionately affects Black or Latina children. The AAP stands ready to lead and work collaboratively to solve difficult issues for children. We look forward to working with everyone here today, with Congress and the administration to put forward policies that advance the safety and effectiveness of medical devices for children. We can and must do better. Olivia reminded us that being a kid is the most important job for childhood. And I encourage us all to hold that sentiment close throughout this workshop. Good luck over the next three days. We look forward to continuing to work with you to advance child health. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Beers. Uh, last but not the least, uh, we will end up our plenary session with uh, final words from uh, Dr. Kurt Newman. Dr. Kurt Newman is the CEO of Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. Dr. Newman. Uh, good morning and thank you. Uh, it's great to be, uh, I guess, kind of here with my fellow plenary uh, speakers. I'm uh, really honored uh, to be part of this three-day virtual workshop. And, you know, SHIP MB is just an incredibly important initiative for streamlining and incentivizing the research and development of pediatric medical devices. Uh, and so I applaud the work that's been done by uh, so many folks, uh, and you'll be hearing from uh, almost all of them uh, uh, over the next couple of days, because it's so important to, to uh, emphasize the mission and increase the creation of pediatric medical devices. So today I'm gonna to focus my remarks on uh, uh, Children's National Hospital. Uh, I'm the CEO of the, uh, of the hospital here in Washington, D.C. Uh, but it's a reflection of uh, work that's being done at all the children's hospitals across the country. And so uh, I'm just thrilled uh, to have the opportunity to uh, uh, represent, uh, uh, represent uh, that uh, part of, the, of all the partnerships. Now this, uh, I'm advancing the slides. This slide uh, is uh, kind of uh, frames how I think about this. Uh, you kind of see me there. I've spent uh, over 30 years of my life as a surgeon, as a pediatric surgeon on the front lines of pediatric healthcare. Uh, 10 years ago, I had the opportunity, and I've only been at Children's National Hospital for all of that. I had the opportunity to become the president and CEO. While I was a surgeon, uh, and you heard the uh, previous uh, uh, speakers uh, uh, talk about this and that compelling uh, discussion uh, by our, our young uh, patient contributor. Uh, I saw firsthand what it meant not to have uh, the tools that you needed as a surgeon. Uh, there was so much innovation going on in the adult uh, side of medicine. Uh, but those uh, devices, the therapeutics, that technology was not available uh, uh, for me and my colleagues uh, for children. And it was extremely frustrating to have to take adult-type uh, devices, which were great for adults, but try to adapt them uh, uh, for use in children. So as a surgeon, uh, I took that uh, 
uh, background into my uh, work as, as CEO and have been strongly committed uh, to changing that. And I love the idea of SHIP MD uh, being able to help catalyze uh, those changes. Uh, I've also had the opportunity to be uh, part of the board of the Children's Hospital Association. And like my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Lee B Beers, who uh, I'm a colleague with, he's president of the AAP, uh, Children's Hospital Association has been at the forefront of trying to uh, advance, advance this, this mission. So as a, a surgeon and as chief of surgery, I felt that it was so difficult to get the things we needed. I needed to find a different uh, way of operating. And so uh, one of the uh, great opportunities I had was to create something called the Sheikh Zayed Institute for Pediatric Surgical Innovation. This was a public-private partnership uh, fueled by uh, uh, philanthropy. Uh, there you see the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates, uh, Yusuf al Ataiba, another great friend and philanthropist in Washington, D.C., Joe Robert, who uh, had really supported our uh, surgical programs at Children's National. And we created one of the first pediatric surgical institutes in the world that was devoted to uh, uh, research and innovation uh, in, in surgery. We started it. Uh, with a large uh, grant from the government of Abu Dhabi to promote uh, this. And our mission was to make surgery more precise, less invasive, and pain-free. And to date, the, uh, this institute over the uh, last uh, uh, 12 years has launched over 22 companies because it was not enough just to uh, create the uh, technology, but we also wanted to commercialize it. And uh, that, those, uh, uh, there's been 12 medical devices that have gone through the process of the FDA and, and received, uh, 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 received clearances, as well as uh, hosting an annual uh, uh, device uh, uh, competition that many of you have participated in. Another great uh, 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 partnership uh, was uh, something called the National Capital Consortium for Pediatric Device Innovation. Uh, in September 2013, the Sheikh Zayed Institute and the University of Maryland at uh, College Park, the A. James Clark School of Engineering, uh, terrific uh, partners for Children's National, received a U.S. Food and Drug Administration, an FDA grant, P50 grant, to form this uh, consortium. Uh, it has uh, just been fantastic because uh, with our additional consortium members, including uh, BioHealth uh, Innovation, the MedTech uh, Innovator Group, and the, our design partner, partner Archimedic, we've been able, uh, uh, by doing this, uh, and we're one of five FDA-funded pediatric device consortia uh, that are focused on, de uh, on the development, production, and distribution of pediatric med medical devices, by all of us coming together uh, this consortium provides mentorship support to over 100 medical startup companies. Now, you see on the uh, picture there uh, a, 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 a photo that is just, uh, I think, really, really cool. Uh, that is uh, the 2018 Medi Make Your Medical Device Pitch for Kids competition. That's Barty Diagnostics uh, Chief Commercial Officer Ken Nelson with his daughter, now, she's a model here uh, for the Carnation Ambulatory Monitor, or CAM. It's the first, world's first P-wave-centric ambulatory cardiac monitor and arrhythmia detection device. You heard uh, Jeff Sheeran talk about uh, the, uh, having adult pacemakers of a certain size, but we couldn't use them in children. And this is another form of the technology, the CAM patch. It's one of the uh, only a few FDA cleared products that is commercially available, think about that, for patients weighing 10 kilograms, that's less than 20, uh, 20 or 22 pounds or more. And uh, what's really exciting is another company, Hillrom, a uh, med uh, technology provider, announced that it was acquiring Barty Diagnostics for $375 million. For, so for those of uh, 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 people that say, well, there's not a market for pediatric devices, I'm proud that the National Capital Consortium 
and all of our stakeholders are uh, showing, and our pitch competition are showing that that is not necessarily uh, true. Now, with all of these companies, with all of the uh, uh, things going on uh, at Children's National Hospital with our own companies, uh, we felt that it was important uh, that we develop a research and innovation campus just for children. Uh, as you know, there are many innovation campuses across the country, but none of them were focused on children. So we thought, uh, because of our unique geography as being the Children's Hospital in the nation's capital, this would be an ideal location for the first. And you can see the proximity uh, there. So it's the uh, little bear that's a, the, the one on the, the bottom bear is the one where our main hospital is, right in the middle of uh, Washington, D.C. But just north of that, above that, um, uh, is uh, where we are building this new campus. And you see its proximity to the FDA, uh, to the NIH, and to the BioHealth Capital Region, not to mention all of the universities and everything else that's going on in Washington, D.C. So uh, the, uh, uh, the site is on the, uh, at the old Walter Reed Army Medical Center, and that land and, and some of the buildings became available. And with the uh, District of Columbia uh, as a partner, uh, we uh, believe that this location would make a lot of sense because, all, after all, also uh, our region, the DMV, is the third or fourth in the biohealth uh, race. And uh, many of those hubs uh, uh, that contribute to that are, uh, are in Maryland and Virginia. So we wanted to uh, uh, make it right here in the District of Columbia uh, so that this city could be uh, uh, our partner as well. And we see this as a huge uh, job creator uh, and an opportunity for companies uh, to uh, relocate as well as our own uh, Children's National uh, Research. And so what I'm showing you uh, now is where we uh, stand in terms of the uh, 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 execution of uh, our plan about this research and innovation campus. Uh, these buildings are, are already there, and they are uh, close. We're close to completing the renovation, which we've been able to move forward with despite uh, the pandemic. And you see a large parking garage there with solar panels. In the bottom corner, you see a, uh, a building uh, 52, which uh, the Rare Disease Institute from Children's National moved in there uh, last month in January and saw their first patient last week. Uh, there's a big conference center there right in the middle, which uh, is building 53 International Conference Center. And I think uh, uh, really exciting about catalyzing uh, this next uh, uh, phase of development uh, is that Johnson & Johnson J Labs at, J -Labs at Washington, D.C. Uh, will be uh, moving into that building 54 uh, here in the uh, first quarter in early 2021. And they uh, will be hosting uh, upwards of 20 to 30 uh, startup companies uh, around uh, research and innovation, and particularly with pediatrics as a focus. I think another uh, exciting uh, opportunity to uh, announce to you all is that the J Labs at Washington, D.C. will also be the hub for something called Blue Night. Uh, this is a collaboration with the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, BARDA, uh, which is a component of the U.S. Department of Health and, and Human Services. And Blue Knight uh, aims to stimulate innovation and incubation of science and technology that improve the health security response. So think about it. Uh, Blue Knight also supports early stage companies focused on potential public health threats and emerging infectious diseases. Uh, so with this pandemic, uh, think of those two uh, uh, missions and having that located on this research and innovation campus. And through Blue Night, Blue Night selected companies may receive uh, assistance for accessing J Labs, accessing dedicated equipment, and dedicated mentorship from BARDA and customized programming. So the goal here is to uh, really accelerate uh, pediatric research and innovation through these partnerships. Uh, we have another terrific uh, partnership in an academic partner, uh, Virginia Tech and the Fralin Institute, uh, and they will uh, be bringing a lot of their brain tumor uh, research uh, to this campus. Uh, so there's just a terrific excitement as this uh, uh, begins to open up 
and companies and uh, other partners uh, begin to, to uh, inhabit our site. So if I uh, uh, wanted to, uh, that's the present. So now the future is that we've gotten support from the District of Columbia and uh, an approval uh, campus uh, uh, for expanding the campus. And you're looking at some renderings of the future of the research and innovation campus. And the total build out would be uh, approximately 1 million square feet. I think another uh, uh, thing, so when people tell me that there's no future in, in pediatric research and innovation and, and uh, the market, uh, I, I can come back with, look, people are willing to make these types of investments and, and, and create these kind of partnerships because, as the previous speaker says, why shouldn't our children uh, have access to that? Why shouldn't they have the same opportunities? Uh, and I, I think another uh, great uh, dimension of this, uh, of this particular campus is in an opportunity zone, which opens up many, many possibilities for uh, public and private partnerships. So uh, finally, uh, I'd like to just answer uh, my, on my part, uh, when somebody asked me, uh, why should uh, I, I or my organization participate in SHIP MD? And I think, uh, uh, I think this three-day uh, uh, conference will uh, provide a lot of evidence for that. But from the children's hospital perspective, I think we should all support and participate in this initiative because it's the easiest way to facilitate safe pediatric medical device development. And what's, uh, there's, you know, it's just so important for our, the physicians, the doctors, the nurses, uh, uh, the innovators and scientists across the board uh, to have the ability uh, to bring this, these uh, technological advancements uh, to our, our, our children. It's just the greatest investment uh, that we in our country can make. So uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to participate. I look forward to the next three days and, and learning as much as I can about what everybody else is doing and how we can move this important mission and this important organization forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Newman. Uh, it was such a pleasure having you here, and uh, I do hope that you'll join us uh, for the next three days for the entire event. Uh, and I would also like to thank everyone in the audience for tuning into the plenary session of the, uh, this workshop. The plenary session is now closed.